Uh, Glenn Wagner is my guest. Welcome, Glenn. Great to be with you. I, I, I asked you the question in the green room if you had been here years ago when I interviewed Coach McCartney from Promise Keepers, and you said you had. I yes. thought you had, because when I saw your name, I thought, I sort of remember that name, somewhere right. in the distant past. You've written yes. a book here called Fire in Your Bones, Ignite Your Life with, Pyre, with Power. There, there it is uh, on the screen. And uh, the, the, main, the, the, the most important part of the book, from my view, is, is beginning with chapter eight. But the, right. first, uh, the first few chapters, you talk about uh, the igniting of an, what you call an incarnational life. Right. What, what do you mean by that? What I mean by that is that um, I think we kind of moved away uh, not kind of, we really have, to a performance-based Christianity, in particular with Western culture and how it's dominated um, our theology and even the theology of church and relationship to Christ. Jesus, God taking on flesh, was referred to and is referred to as the incarnation. And so in the Old Testament, you have the temple, the tabernacle, wherever the tabernacle was, was there was the presence of God. Jesus taking on flesh is referred to and told, we're told that he tabernacled among us. He was the very presence of God. So everywhere that Jesus stepped, stuff happened. Uh, demons fled, people were healed, people came to love him and embrace him, people tried to kill him. Uh, but it was never neutral. Hmm. And now uh, scripture tells us that through faith in Christ, the spirit of Christ lives within us. We are God's tabernacle where he dwells, that wherever we step, God's stuff is to be taking place. And that we can expect that, but also to reveal ourselves and understand that I am to live out the very presence of Christ uh, in this tabernacle. Hmm. That's the incarnational life and, and yeah. the fire in your bones. Uh, I think you quote uh, Jeremiah at some yes. point. You know, yeah. I, I, try, I tried to shut up, I couldn't. His, his word was like a f fire in my bones. Right. And I couldn't hold it in. Yeah. Uh, and so you, you're not promoting uh, just fervency here, you're promoting no. um, an everyday kind of uh, right. reality of Christ in us, the hope of glory. Right, and staying away from the concept of enthusiasm, right, right and just kind of emotionally getting high on Christ or whatever, because that only lasts for a few moments, mm. and then we got to get our fix all the time. Right. Um, what I'm talking about is the very core of our identity comes from Christ. That's why the chapter on on the extreme makeover that, yeah. that we have to understand and, and grow in that core identity where there is a power and a passion that even when I'm upset with God, as Jeremiah, even when no one's listening to the message God's given me, all I've getting is grief from being obedient to Christ. There is still this, this passion and this power that burns in me that I can't help but, but speak of those things. Now you mentioned in the book that when you were um fairly new in the ministry, you were given the awesome opportunity of pastoring, uh, is it Calvary Church in Charlotte? No, my first church was in Pennsylvania. My, the last church I pastored was in Calvary. Well, was in Cal okay, yeah. so Cal but it was, it was Calvary where things mm -hmm. began to emerge. Now this is a right. church I think where, where Billy Graham used to attend, is it not? This is where it's gr he, grew, uh, he grew up, uh, the latter years of his college, high school and so forth. Right. His father was one of the founding elders. Yeah, oh, tremendous yeah. history. Yeah, real history there, well-known <laughs> church. Well, about 2,500 people or so, or no. Yeah, it's it, over 3,000. Over 3,000, yeah. yeah. Um, so you, you, you're given this, the opportunity to pastor this church and uh, you, you're all excited about it. You right. pastored it for seven years, but in that seven year period, something began to emerge. Tell us about right. that. Well, there were five incredible years. Um, but then it's, you know, all things begin to change. There's dynamics uh, in every ministry. And um, in the midst of that, over the last two years, I didn't realize uh, within me, apart from you know, church dynamics and all of that sort of thing, that within me there were changes taking place that I didn't understand. And throughout my life, uh, I pretty much that had the mindset that if I'm tired, I work harder. If I multitask more, if I pray more, read my Bible more, spend more time with God, the more, more, more syndrome, mm. Uh, and that was, that was fine, but uh, cumulatively over uh, a lifetime and a ministry time in particular of being incredibly uh, involved, incredibly stressed, uh, enjoying, however, what God was doing, mm -hmm. uh, my body began to shut down and uh, I didn't realize all of it, didn't understand it, just kept saying, well, I'm tired, um, I just need a break, need some rest. And, uh, but it got to the point where I couldn't think uh, clearly, uh, couldn't read, 
couldn't focus. Uh, driving in the car would often forget where I was. And then uh, came to a cataclysmic uh, time and uh, where my wife actually had to pull the car off the road because uh, at the traffic light I couldn't figure out where to go. And so um, it was a uh, devastating time. Um, and it wasn't a time in which, well, this can't happen to me, kind of pride time. This was the thing of uh, just not realizing it was happening to me. And what was happening to you? Physiologically and chemically, everything was just shutting down. Is this what they call the classic burnout? Classic burnout, clinical depression. Clinical depression? Um, which is uh, physiologically, everything's changing. Um, and the damage over the long haul of, and the long period of time, uh, so much so that I, uh, I asked the doctor in the course of, of treatment, will I ever be able to write again? Will I ever be able to, to read, to interact at a level that I enjoyed interaction at? Um, that's the first thing that I wrote coming out of this. Uh, that's why it's large type and small <laughs> few pages, right. but it was basically to try and capture even my heart's desire was, was you know, God, uh, why exist if I can't walk in that and live in that? Uh, you know, ministry apart, if you've still called me to something, even though I was hearing all of the voices saying you're disqualified from ministry, you should never go back into it. Um, Saying, God, I just need to know who I am and what your call is on my life because every believer in Christ has a calling that yep. they're to pursue, a life mission that God's called them to. Um, but the most difficult thing, you know, when word got out that I was seeking medical help as well as uh, spiritual help and godly counsel, um, all sorts of misunderstandings came out of all that. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you can almost, um, you know, fall victim to any affliction as a pastor. Right. Except for depression. Yes. Uh, because yeah. the, 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 there's a real prejudice, if you will, with regard to depression. It's, uh, I remember one psychologist telling me it's the only uh, physical affliction that has uh, spiritual symptoms. Yes. And, and uh, people don't want their shepherd to be spiritually uh, victimized or spiritually weak. Correct.